I'd like to start by thanking Boa Ventura and the whole organizing committee for putting together such an important intellectual and political event. And I'm really honored to be speaking here with all of you today. In the presentation today, I want to discuss the necessity of rethinking epistemologies in order to develop theories adequate for our global age and for the global historicity of our age. My disciplinary background is in sociology, and so my talk will be oriented to looking at the ways in which sociology has traditionally understood the global. I want to examine what is at stake in such definitions, what Boa Ventura has called their cognitive injustices, and how we might consider alternative formulations through an approach that I call connected sociologies. From its inception, classical sociology was primarily concerned with the European origins of processes of modernity that were to become global. Both Marx and Weber, for example, sought to outline the peculiar conditions of Europe vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world that they believed to have given rise to the world historical processes of capitalism. The global as a specific category, insofar as it can be inferred from their writings, was the space in which processes initiated in Europe came to play out as world historical. There was little discussion of how the global might be understood in terms of processes not directly identified as capitalist, but nonetheless contributing to modernity. For example, colonial settlement, dispossession, enslavement, and other forms of appropriation. The failure to recognize prior global connections or to regard them as significant for capitalism can be attributed in part at least to the elision of colonialism and empire to capitalism within these approaches. This was an elision that saw colonialism as not integral to the emergence and development of capitalist modernity, while empire was barely addressed as a geopolitical form. With colonial expansion, and its associated processes of dispossession, appropriation, and enslavement, displaced from the construction of core sociological accounts of modernity, it was also deemed to have little relevance to the subsequent development of sociology. It was not until the global order constituted by colonialism visibly fractured that other societies came into European and North American view in their own right. The convulsions in the early to mid 20th century of the two world wars, and in particular the emergence of the competing regimes of fascism, defeated, and communism resurgent, together with the movements of decolonization, dramatically reconfigured the world. The beginnings of a decline of Western European hegemony and the shift in the landscape of the global from being organized in colonial terms to being organized now around the desire for nation states necessitated developments within sociology in order to address the limitations of post-classical accounts of modernity. Modernization theory was one attempt to address these issues, but given the political situation, it was closely followed by underdevelopment and dependency theory, reflecting more critical approaches. Even if currently existing communism was identified by few scholars as the true alternative to capitalism that Marx had envisaged, its very presence created the space for thinking of different alternatives. It also acted as a goad to liberal democracies in terms of indicating the necessity of addressing issues of inequality, including racial inequality, exclusion, and civil rights, and broadening the idea of rights to include social rights though in truth, these had been first instigated by non-Western contributors to the post-war declaration of human rights. Notwithstanding any limitations attributed to modernization theory's view of convergence, it did at least imply also the further modification of the societies associated with the exemplary form. So in this way, not only was modernity understood to be differentiated, but its exemplary form was regarded as unfinished and, in principle, reformable. The meaning of modernity was at stake at this time, 
and Eurocentric accounts did not seem to hold all the cards. From the perspective of developments in mainstream sociological theory, however, this critical moment in, in approaches to the idea of the global passed. A moment when dominant Western ideas were under challenge disappeared. The collapse of communism in Europe in the late 1980s dramatically altered the context for sociological self-understandings of the discipline and its worlds. With the absorption of communist Europe to its other, the moment of alternatives, of non-alignment, and even of the reform of liberal capitalism was ostensibly over. This latter is indicated by the rise of neoliberalism in the late 70s and 1980s and the virtual silence within mainstream sociology of its practical deconstruction of the very idea of a differentiated modern society with a subordinated economic system. This moment both heralded a new phase in sociological theory, oriented to a future held to be that of a new globalization, notwithstanding the globalized nature of what had preceded it, and a consciousness of the limitations of current sociological theory. These limitations were associated primarily with critiques of modernization theory, but the proposed sociological reconstruction, multiple modernities, came to look very much like modernization theory rebooted. For example, the various formulations, multiple modernities, alternative modernities, liquid modernities, and so on, all maintain the originary form of modernity as European and as formed as separate from any consideration of the colonial histories that were contemporaneous to its supposed emergence. I will return to these issues but now I want to move to discuss the significance of post-colonial and decolonial histories and critique and the difference that they could make to such understandings. Post-colonial and decolonial arguments have been most successful in their challenge to the insularity of historical narratives and historiographical traditions emanating from Europe. This has been particularly so in the context of demonstrating the parochial character of arguments about the endogenous European origins of modernity in favor of arguments that suggest the necessity of considering the emergence of the modern world in the broader histories of colonialism, empire, and enslavement. As Barber argues, the insistent location of modernity in the French and industrial revolutions, for example, reveals the Eurocentricity of theorists a Eurocentricity that is made more apparent if instead we start from Haiti. By bearing witness to different pasts, one is not a passive observer, but is able to turn from interrogating the past to initiating new dialogues about that past and thus bringing into being new histories and from those new histories, new presents and new futures. Post-colonial discourse at its best, Barber suggests, contests modernity through the establishment of other historical sites. And in so doing, articulates understandings of modernity and the political possibilities associated with such reconfigurations. As Spivak, <coughs> excuse me, as Spivak similarly argues, it provides the basis from which to reclaim a series of regulative political concepts the supposedly authoritative narrative of whose production was written elsewhere. The task following Spivak is less about the uncovering of philosophical ground than in reversing, displacing, and seizing the apparatus of value coding itself. That is, of the apparatus through which, as Boer suggests, cognitive injustices are coded. This is something that has been done quite admirably by the scholars associated with the modernity slash coloniality school of thought. The theoretical distinction modernity-coloniality was first articulated by Annabel Quejano in English in 2007. The arguments, of course, had been made in Spanish much earlier. His argument is that with the conquest of the lands that we now call America, began the constitution of a new world order culminating 500 years later in a global power covering the whole planet. 
This coloniality of power, expressed through political and economic spheres, he continues, was strongly associated with the coloniality of knowledge or of imagination, articulated as modernity, rationality. The modernity that Europe takes as the context for its own being is, however, so deeply imbricated in the structures of European colonial domination over the rest of the world that, as Cajano argues, it's impossible to separate the two, hence modernity slash coloniality. Mignola further elaborates this distinction in the context of the work of epistemic decolonization necessary to undo the damage wrought by both modernity and by understanding modernity coloniality only as modernity. The decolonization of knowledge, he suggests, occurs in acknowledging the sources and geopolitical locations of knowledge, while at the same time affirming those modes and practices of knowledge that have been denied by the dominance of other forms. He is not arguing simply for a geopolitics of location as central to any academic endeavor, but rather a consideration of what that geopolitics enables to be known and how it is to be known. Both post-colonialism and decoloniality are developments within the broader politics of knowledge production, and they both emerge out of political developments contesting the colonial world order established by European empires, albeit in relation to different time periods and different geographical orientations. They are only made necessary as a consequence of the depredations of colonialism, but in their intellectual resistance to associated forms of epistemological dominance, they offer more than simple opposition. They offer, in the words of Maria Lugones, the possibility of a new geopolitics of knowledge. The perspective of connected sociologies, with which I wish to conclude this presentation, starts from a recognition that events are constituted by processes that are always broader than the selections that bound events as particular and specific to their theoretical constructs. It is inspired by the call by the historian Sanjay Subramaniam for connected histories, which he argues do not derive from a singular standpoint, whether that's a putatively universal standpoint or the standpoint of a generalized subaltern, Rather, connected sociologies seeks to reconstruct theoretical categories, their relations and objects, and to create new understandings that incorporate and transform previous ones. Connected sociologies recognizes a plurality of possible interpretations and selections, not as a description of events and processes, but as an opportunity for reconsidering what we had previously thought we had known. The different sociologies in need of connection are themselves located in time and space, including the time and space of colonialism, empire, and brackets post-colonialism. They will frequently arise as discordant and challenging voices, and they may even be resisted on that basis, a resistance that is made easier by the geospatial stratification of the academy itself, something that is being challenged very well in this gathering. The consequence of different perspectives must be to open up examination of events and processes such that they are understood differently in light of that engagement. Put another way, engaging with different voices must move us beyond simple pluralism to make a difference to what we had initially thought. Not so that we come to think the same as each other, but that we think differently from how we had previously thought prior to our engagement. To return to the question of multiple modernities, which some have seen as a sufficient response to post-colonial and decolonial critiques, I would suggest that this particular sociological trope is precisely antithetical to the sort of argument that I wish to make. And in deconstructing it, I hope to demonstrate the different promise of connected sociologies. Theorists of multiple modernities sidestep the issue of historical global interconnections, those connections argued for by theorists of underdevelopment and of dependency. And they only regard as significant those connections that brought European modernity to other societies. 
Although, of course, they don't actually address the historical processes of colonialism in, and enslavement and dispossession by way of which these processes were brought to other societies. Rather, these processes are euphemized under terms such as European contact or mere diffusion. In this way, theorists of multiple modernities continue to assert the necessary priority of the West in the construction of a comparative sociology of multiple modernities and end up privileging the same understanding of modern societies as earlier modernization theorists. So in effect, they seek to contain challenges to the dominant theoretical framework of sociology by not allowing difference to make a difference to what are seen as the original categories of modernity. The paradox is that while modernization theory had engaged with difference as an issue that potentially placed its Western form at stake, the multiple modernities approach embraces difference at the same time as articulating the ideological and political success of Western modernity. This is notwithstanding that the period since the 1980s was also associated with widening social and economic inequalities and challenges to the mixed economies and welfare regimes that earlier modernization theorists had seen as stable characteristics of a late modernity with the capacity for reform. Whereas earlier modernization theorists had argued for a reformed and reformable modernity, theorists of multiple modernities, who otherwise stress endogenous processes, have little to say about the internal processes giving rise to widening inequality and the dismantling of the achievements that the previous generation had associated with modernity. What is absent from the account of multiple modernities is any address of the change in the nature of the form it holds to be exemplary and the implications of this for the standard normative understandings of modernity. Indeed, the reduction of the social to the economic, the neoliberal global project, for example, is seen to be the product of processes of globalization external to Europe and no longer a process Europe inaugurated in its relations with the rest of the world. As Boer has suggested, there is a cognitive injustice at work here, and its sociological address requires a radical revision of Western sociology's self-understanding. It should be noted that such a revision necessarily decenters that European self-understanding, but it is inclusionary and universal universalable to the extent that it seeks to address connections at the same time as displacing myths of origin. A connected sociology's approach then enables us to locate Europe within wider processes, address the ways in which Europe created and then benefited from the legacies of colonialism and enslavement, and examine what Europe needs to learn from those it dispossessed in order to address the problems we currently face. Connected Sociologies points to the work needed in common to make good on the promise of a reinvigorated sociological imagination in service of social justice in a global world. While this position begins with a critique of sociology, it also expresses a commitment to an expanded and inclusionary sociological imagination. The promise of constructive criticism is expanded meaning. These aspects are well captured in Fanon's conclusion to The Wretched of the Earth, where he exhorts, Come then, comrades, the European game has finally ended. We must find something different. Although for those of us watching the World Cup, the fear is that Germany might show otherwise. Setting aside football, though, the concern to find something different remains urgent, and gatherings like this one take us forward in establishing the worlds within which we would wish to live. Thank you.